is enough, I'll show you the typical movement and then you know dancing with me, right? <laughs> okay, that's enough to know. Yeah. I, I, have a, I have had the idea of a very provoking talk. Yeah. And I know there's only the hardcore people remaining, so I'm sure you might understand. Yeah. Um, and uh, it means that I am I'm going back to the history of my own research. I skip, of course, the company presentation. We see a few rooms of our customers. And I start here. Yeah. Where do I come from? Well, originally, I was a researcher in theoretical informatics, uh, and partly in complexity theory. Okay? I don't know what it, what it, if you know what it means, but by 89, in 1990, I was developing algorithms. And one of the algorithms which I was programming at this time was decomposing multidimensional structures <laughs> in a minimum time. This work was, for instance, published in, in Canada, or together with the Technical University of Graz, on an American joint Russian conference, because the Russians were very good in algorithms at this time. Yeah? And it uh, was a geometrical algorithm, and it allowed, when you normally need 1,000 steps of computing, it only needed 30 steps of computing, which of course you can then convert to decompose uh, uh, complex architectures into molecules and, and more simple structures. That was one part of my work. Okay? Another part of my work was that I was a researcher in complexity theory. Here, what's a complexity theory? It means it's later simpler like in quantum theory. Yeah? So, uh, so it means that, uh, that you have chaotic behavior of particles and you still want to understand the relationship and find a common framework to express this complex situation. Yeah? Then you need mathematical models to describe this complexity. So Sasabe so is not here anymore, but he's right, I came from theory. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but it allowed me to understand uh, structures, algorithms. Uh, very complex situations, and that drove my whole life later. And in 1990, I changed over to another institute because uh, the institute had at this time in the theoretical uh, informatics was done, and the American came in and he looked like a matrix reloaded Neo, all the black and leather, and very strange person again. Okay? And uh, that was Mr. Haas. Uh, Daniel will know him, and I said, no way, I don't work for that guy, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and so I got uh, my job uh, at the Institute of Informatics, yeah? And that was uh, the Professor Mauer, and he was one of the co-developers of some parts of the internet at this time. Uh, when you use nowadays computer graphics, or graphics which you transport through the HTTP protocol, it was developed at this institute with the patent of, of Austria design. And I got the task and I had to go into the software engineering department of research and my task was suddenly I entered studies. And one study which changed my eyes was I had to do a study what's the difference in software development and quality between the Americans, the Europeans and the Japanese. That was this study. It was an internal report uh, published by the Austrian Research, uh, with me as an, as an author, as you see, and some institute heads uh, on top of it, yeah, but you see my name there, 1991, and it was the most sold yeah, study by the Austrian industry throughout. Okay, nearly every company in Austria and also in southern Germany took a copy because it was a clear overview, and from there on, I knew Japanese techniques. I seen Ishikawa, things like that. Okay? And, uh, but I knew other approaches as well, and we started to work into that area. And one of the projects we went in was Bootstrap, because we became the engineering partner in Bootstrap. Bootstrap was this project many, many times. 
and the University of Graz appointed me as the researcher. Okay, so you can imagine I went in, they showed me this bloody model, okay, and I said, well, I am a theoretical mathematician, I can program as well, but for me that's not the structure. If someone tells me one level, one organization, it's not me. Yeah? You can imagine that I usually wanted to decompose things, describe a structure, write an algorithm, see relationships. Yeah? That was too simple for me. It was actually me who invented the profile. Yeah? It, was, uh, it was published in Springer. It was uh, no one else had proposed it before. It was programmed in a, in a program which I had programmed the first time. It was programmed originally in Pascal and in C. Presented 1991 to the industry and published by Springer when we had written the article in 1992 under shifting paradigms in soft engineering, two years before SPICE started. Yeah. So it's actually the researcher who brought you the profiles was me because of the algorithm thinking I brought with me from the programming. Because it was for me too simple. When we have complexity theory and when you go later to quantum physics, you cannot say to a quark, you want one object. Not possible. It's a vector. Even it has a probability and the spin in it and the state in it. Yeah? And it, by the probability, it might even determine if you can observe it here or not here. Right? So the point is, it's a complex relationship of factors which describe an object. And that was the reason which drove me to that profile. Another issue was, uh, we were, as we were the institute uh, at this time that was co-developed in the internet protocols yeah? and we were responsible at this time in that institute for some parts of that protocol, especially when it came to the transmission of graphics we organized one of the first conferences in Europe where Mikros was referring to, where the whole conference was about networking it was at this time already mentioning all the things you use now yeah? Team working on the internet, uh, uh, security of the internet. If you buy the book, you find even nowadays what you use now as a technology in that network conference. Okay? And that was the starting point of the year of two projects, two new projects which I personally was appointed from the university to enter Ireland yeah, and implement the idea of a network of experts. Yeah? I was paid by the commission. I was sponsored by the University of Graz and the company of uh, what uh, Milko mentioned, Hans Jürgen Kugler, uh, should support me. Right? And you have heard the story. And then another part of my background is I did an army officer education in the 80s and I did about three years services, distributed over time. I was a chief lieutenant and I had financed my study with that. So when I met Nico, Nico there, I was a researcher, was very convinced of myself, my algorithms, right? I had this Stalin style, but I had, a, I, I had an education as an officer. So if he comes in and says, I am out, you know, you can imagine I defended myself, right? So this image was right, okay? I'm not giving up. Things were easy, yeah? Good. Uh, so this, this was uh, then the starting point of Eurospy, in the ISN conferences, because it was too. Uh, European Union networking projects financed by the Commission and supported by the University in the offices of Kugler's company at this time yeah, to start it up. But then, of course, when someone says you shouldn't do the work anymore, I'm not giving up. Yeah? <laughs> that was the issue at this time because Mr. Kugler left and said project is over and I said I'm not leaving, I implement this project. Yeah? That was the department at this time. Okay, but of course I know him while we were publishing together. And now I make a jump, because then for four years we worked with experts, in the first four years before it became Eurospy. And you know what? Because I have been programming software at the time when we looked at very complex algorithms, I always knew structure is important. Yeah? But we had some thoughts about it, which we collected by a group of experts, and it was one chapter in that famous book, Software engineering that was written by me. Not only I was editing the book, but I was writing some part of it. And uh, at this time, we started to compare what is our mindset and where are our limits in thinking. Yeah? And our mindset in Europe is largely driven by still the Greek philosophy. Yeah? 
And uh, so we concluded in this book, when you look at Plato, there's a kind of story, he sits in a cave and all he sees a mirror of the real world, but it's an ideal, never changing world. Okay? Still nowadays we believe <coughs> that we as programmers can describe a real world which becomes an ideal world and hopefully it never changes. Yeah? <laughs> and is wrong. Good. So we said already that the book does not meet the complexity does not meet the fact that the world is changing every time when you look at it, Heisenberg, okay? And in fact, the, the level of abstraction yeah, is also not sufficient. So we went further and said, what did the Greeks about it? Yeah? Then we said, well, we found a, another Greek, but there's a mistake in it that it should be written Heraclitus or Heraclitus, okay? If that would be Hercules, someone told me. But that's a different issue, okay? And he said, at the same time, all things flow, right? Which actually is the same statement, but more uh, general what Heisenberg stated. Yeah? So there is never a system, what Guigi said, when you look at it 10 minutes later and it's the same. It's not the same, it has changed. Right? And the question is, how do we deal with that change? And uh, I come to more conclusions. Yeah? And in this book, then, we also came to something, the thinking of what we implement nowadays. It's old, it's Aristoteles, yeah, the pupil of Plato, because he already defined the object orientation. So it means he defined already that we should group, you see the example, uh, case by things in different groups, I see a horse, then I see another horse, and another, the horse are not exactly like, but they have something in common. The common are the attributes which you do to the form horse. So it's an object, an object with attributes and methods, yeah? and they have relationships. Now, this guy lived about 500 years before Jesus, so it's about 2,600 years old. When we look at our programming languages now, yeah? and we look at our object orientation, is there not any more? Okay. So in the same book we then said, the way we think nowadays is based on old paradigms from the Greek, and we miss the mapping to modern physics and research and philosophy. We will never develop to the next stage of our development without leaving these limits. Okay? The Aristoteles is saying, make this drawing, 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 and you will be happy because it meets all the complexity of the whole development. Do you really believe that? No. Okay? okay? So, next step, okay, so we then thought, and that's where the book stopped, and then I continued with some other thoughts, yeah. The book stopped there with this, that we said we have to accept, 1999 stage, yeah, that we need dynamic architectures. So we need a change from the stable object view to a completely configurable system view. This is, this is the basis where we started from a German automotive when you look back now, yeah. It is exactly the basis, because when you now take a diesel fuel injection, yeah, or you take a steering wheel system of ZF, of these companies that are here on the table, do you think we have 500 different software projects, or do you think we have one software that is used in 500 variants by configuring different parameters that then define what functionality we offer? This is the solution what we had at this time. So we developed one core framework which is easily adaptable to any dynamic situation. But unfortunately, I am now in one project where I am consulting in Vienna, this has met the limits now again. I am consulting a project where we now have 16,000 software modules in one project. Each module, many thousand lines, and the relationships are millions. Right? <coughs> so do you think this is enough? That we now have 30,000 parameters to set when we adapt the project to a new customer. The parameters have reached now the complexity which we cannot handle anymore. So also that model worked for some time, but we had the limit. Okay? But even that goes much further than just the V model, the waterfall model, even much further. Because this means that we need a completely new architecture development concept of a configurable platform thinking. Okay? It's not written in Perry it's not written in any of these models, it's not theoretical, it's practical, it's architecture. Okay? But still we say not enough now. So we've discussed further 10 years, okay? Different people on the table, yeah? 
different industries, especially those who were uh, studying physics, mathematics, informatics, in industry settings, etc. Well, the major mistake we do is everything we do is mapped back to the Greek philosophy. And it's good that we have it, because there is a philosophy that is our root, maybe, in Europe. Yeah? But we have modern philosophy, modern physics. Where are they? Where are they in any programming language? Where are they in any kind of model? Nowhere, because no one understood it. If I ask any one of you in the room, do you understand the relativity theory of Einstein? Can any one of you show me on the board how it works? Okay? I think I don't find anyone, even if you are doctors, right? Or maybe one, but you. Yeah? And the issue is, there are some basic principles behind it. Yeah? Modern physics does not regard the atom, but the quarks as the smallest non dividable object. And, and the funny thing is, why we assume that Aristotle is a horse is a form and stays stable, and there's a stable set of attributes. The quantum physics does not think it's stable. Okay? So you have one quark, you have a vector of values, it has a spin, okay? it has a load, yeah? the antivector has a different load, exactly the inverse load, but it has a load, it has a state, and it has a probability, and it has a time. And the quark only takes this kind of state at a certain time with a certain probability, which the physics experts call observable state. Yeah? So you don't have to understand this uh, in, in, in the whole set of the Schrödinger equation, but yeah, what you have to understand is that one object at the same time here and the same time there might look different, even if it's used in the same object style. Which program language nowadays would express that? Which model would nowadays of you drawing a model for soft tension express that fact? None. Okay? This is the answer. And this is my problem with the whole world, because when I go to an automotive... <laughs> no, if I go to a big automotive project, yeah, where is this complexity? Everyone tries to simplify it to one simple model, but the reality is completely complex, and the reality is quantum physics, and it's not any more classical physics of Newton time. Yeah? And our models must convert to the new time. Yeah? We are drawing models which even a pupil in the, in, this, in, in, the, in the first school, in the elementary school, could understand. Here's a square, and here's a square, and here's a square. Draw, draw, draw. Done. Okay. Can <laughs> this be complexity of software engineering? No. Yeah. And that is where Kumichi comes in. Because you might see a chaotic process, but there is order in the chaos when you understand that there is something else in the systematic we have to model in the future. This is also my next statement. The way the universe was built, exactly the structure we see now, was dependent on probability. It was not dependent on just, here is a, a number, here is a number, here is a fixed operation and that is the outcome. Yeah? The quarks <laughs> have a certain probability to appear in a certain state over time. Yeah? Every quark. Yeah? So it's a certain probability that comes together with certain quarks form a proton. Yeah? But it's driven by probability. And Heisenberg also stated, when he looks at it, by any energy you put on it, it changes. Right? So it means we have not understood so far that we need a programming language which is intelligent enough to have this movability over time of an object considered in the model and the programming language. That's the nature of all we have. We always try to put it back to the object orientation, but we have not enough thought about architecture and what process models should do. Also, a process model is a framework model. Some of you stated today is a keynote. It should be a framework which is adaptable to different situations and learns by itself. Yeah? Like which you said, next time it's not an identical copy. Yeah? So every one of us draws a nice model for processes, and then we force everyone to use it even if it changes, right? So, is that the right thinking? So, next slide is, uh, I brought the example of evolution. So, if we look and we say creative process, like how the world came together in quantum physics is a creative process. We can discuss if there was a God or not, okay? That's another discussion. 
I come to some conclusion at the end, okay? Without religion. And, uh, yeah, I learned from some keynote <laughs> It's not good to do, okay? Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, when you take any one of you and they ask you a question now, yeah? And I ask you two years later exactly the same question. Will you give exactly the same answer? No. Yeah? So the human mind model yeah, is, a, is a kind of network processor connecting context to come to a conclusion, depending on time and probability. So it's, again, it's like a first version of a quantum physics computer. It's much more complex than we put models in nowadays. Yeah. So, where do we see that feature in nowadays programming languages? Where do we see that in our ways we model processes? Nowhere again. Okay? I saw your faces when Quinchy was presenting and you were thinking, boring, I don't understand. Okay? But the reason is, that's wrong. If we ever want to meet the next evolution in the next 20 years, we need a new type of programming language, we need a new way of modeling language or processes, and we need to get into this bloody situation that we can see the evolution over time. If a model doesn't have that, we can skip it. Yeah? Or at least in these complexity situations I am in, in these big projects. Yeah? So the question is, when it comes to that, yeah, what's an ideal state? <coughs> because even if you say, let's skip things like God, and let's think, <coughs> skip things like uh, ideal world of Plato, but I observed one thing, and there was there's one thing uh, which impressed me. We had one person who works at CERN, unfortunately he died because of cancer uh, last year, who was regularly in Graz, and, uh, and we have a kind of in Graz a community which is called Pro Talent, yeah, where we teach young children to become interested in research. And people all over the world who have a route to Graz come back for one week and make extra courses for young people. And that was one person from CERN. And he, had an, and he was teaching about quantum physics. Yeah? And the funny thing about it is, he used a kind of symbolism that whatever we search for, it must have a balance. Okay? Because wherever we search in physics, we see a balance. When the formula gets right, there is a balance. When you look at uh, the simple, most simple uh, uh, picture that he was used was the spectral colors. Yeah? If you see red, it looks like a color. If you see blue, if you see green, would you believe it becomes non-visible when you mix it? Yeah? So the ideal state of us seeing crystal and not seeing red in between is mixing these three colors. So in fact, we have a balance of colors in light, in the, in the light stream, right? When we go to matter and antimatter, yeah? then it's interesting uh, that when you look at the, at the structure of a hydrogen atom yeah, it means that you have one time a positive, one time a negative or an inverse load yeah, and uh, uh, the antimatter has an inverse spin but you know what happens when the antimatter and the matter meet? Yeah? you get the gamma stream yeah? the gamma stream is the highest energy X-ray. That's the pure form of energy. So you have a pure form of energy mixing the balance between two. So the whole physics is built on balance. Yeah? If your mathematical or your kind of architecture doesn't show balance, you're not right. The same is when it goes to understanding the formula of Einstein, yeah? it doesn't say more than energy is equal to mass. Okay? So there's a balance between mass and energy. And when it comes to the, what do you take? Gravitational time dilation. Why do you take that? Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, okay, <coughs> that's an interesting issue. This, was, uh, this is a kind of balance between uh, mass and time. Okay? So it means when you put a watch on a, on a far away from the Earth, when you take a watch down to the earth, the higher the gravity field is, the lower the watch is working. Okay? And this, this means that, uh, that or yeah, uh, the other 
the time flows near so sound. Yeah, that was fine. Yeah, okay. So, so we see a relationship, and there's also some relationship that changes depending on the relationship between the objects. So uh, I ask you one question. Did any one of you ever hear about the metric of an architecture of balance? Software architecture of balance, or browser architecture of balance. Did you ever do a metric like that? I did one, right? <laughs> I did it in a Wagner powertrain gear shifting project. Well, Nissan, as a Japanese company, was checking on the project. So we measured complexity on the balance of the architecture between coupling and cohesion. Yeah? So it's one way to look at things, how you get in control yeah, of the complexity of a system. So my projection is, and uh, I said I make a provoking talk for 20 years, yeah? I know that some of you might not have understood anyhow, okay? Yes, I uh, might want to go into that crazy direction, okay? But so Sabe san is right. Europe make crazy ideas, okay? The others implement, but I hope we also are able to implement in Europe part now, okay? Three things I say, yeah? It's not only about distributed processes, I mean here a large network of processes developed by different teams, each evolving over time. And a certain task is distributed to the most probable solution. So I think in future we should incorporate in a complex distributed architecture probability. Much more the probability. The whole quantum physics is built on probability of an observable state. What does it mean? I take a practical example of, of uh, burnt in a car, what you showed. Yeah? We move from a single component in a car to cars talking to each other. So, you have a network of cars now who can exchange information. And sometimes the cars are confronted in a certain area with the same traffic situation. So we can compare the decisions of cars and come to the most probable solution for the right uh, uh, decision. The same is when you when we enter the cloud in the future, yeah, you might have one programming task, but you might have alternative solutions to it, like the human brain, yeah. And some of might already be where you want to be in two years from now. Okay? So you distribute the tasks over the net, get a cluster of answers, and take the most probable, most probable answer as the answer you continue with. That would be a mapping of the uh, quantum physics to the future somehow. Yeah? I have no idea how it exactly <coughs> should work, but as I come from complexity theory and algorithmic things, I can describe that in mathematical terms. But, uh, but uh, it has still to be implemented. Yeah? The second issue is, I think that uh, we need the principle of architecture design where we need new matrix about balance of an architecture. If I take the 60,000 software modules and I take the original structure of what we should do in object orientation, we cannot manage. How do I convert that architecture to an architecture which looks more balanced so that we have an overview about the architecture? In the project where I was, Implementing it the first time in automotive, uh, we, we said that a good architecture is a balance between coupling and cohesion. Cohesion is a measure of how much you package the functionality in specific modules, and uh, it's cohesion, sorry, cohesion, and coupling is how much you uh, exchange between the modules. And of course, the signal flows are a lot, so you cannot get rid all, of all of them. But the more you get cohesion, the better. And if you have too much cohesion, you only have too many global variables at the end. Yeah? So it means that, uh, that there is a kind of balance. And we measure the balance of these two values as an optimum balance as one of the matrix. And I think we should look at that. And the, said, the third one is, I think when we were programming in the 90s, and I, I had to leave this direction for some time, now it's 23 years later, maybe I come back. Yeah? But we had programs. Yeah? where we used random generators to make a decision of what we do next. You know what we could draw with the random generators? Trees. We could actually draw real physical objects by random functions. Random, right? We entered, where do we make a point? Okay, we took a random generator, <coughs> let it draw like the, this Upperman theory, upper, where you entered the new world and again created one more. Yeah? But it was done by random generators, not by a fixed algorithm. It was not a deterministic algorithm. These were 
random generators where we put the pixel in. Okay? And that's the wonderful issue because there is, in the probabilistic theory, there is an order. We think it's chaos, but there is an order. Right? There is an order in the way we come to a creative process. And I don't see any programming language and any model so far that is enough with that. Okay? So that is, as I said, a provoking message for now. Yeah, I know I'm doing spice, I earn money with that, but for the moment I want to make 20 years provoking message for architecture design. How we cope with complexity theory in architecture in the future. Thank you. Okay, I think yeah. Just very short, in combinatorial optimization, there, there is a theory of the, the, in which there are proofs that the random methods are, are the best for solving some problems. I heard of this uh, earlier. Yeah, and, and I think we, we miss these kind of considerations yes. in the programming languages and making decisions uh, about uh, the behavior we want to reach as a state in the system. Okay, so uh, is there more? Are there more questions or did I shock you too much? Yeah? <laughs> <coughs> okay, so if we can take in the bus, yeah? The coffee is still outside, take a cake, take coffee, the bus is already waiting. But uh, so take coffee and cake for five, ten minutes, but run to the bus after the case. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs>